Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in thee. I said to the Lord, Thou art my Lord. I have no good besides thee. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. I shall not pour out their libations of blood, nor shall I take their names upon my lips. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and my cup. Others support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I've set the Lord continually before me because he is my right hand. He is at my right hand and I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. Thou will make me to know the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. In thy right hand are pleasures forever. Father, we love you this morning and just want to thank you for our great salvation. Thank you that you are a great God. As our choir just sang, all-powerful, ruling and reigning in the heavens above. And we thank you that nothing happens in this world apart from your providence and what you allow. We know we live in a fallen world and that when sin entered into the world, that creation fell with it. We think of our friends in Florida who have suffered great harm in the last week. Some who have seemingly lost everything. And yet we were virtually totally protected. Not because we're more righteous than they, for your son taught us differently when tragedy comes. But we pray for them. We pray for the churches all across the state of Florida, those evangelical churches that are coming together and going to those places of great harm. And we pray that you would use their testimony and their witness. And we pray that you would use this terrible event in the lives of those who've never met you as a reminder of what is yet to come. Father, we think of those even in our own community who have never met Jesus as Lord. We are asking you through our fall festival and friend day this year to bring people into your kingdom. And so I thank you for those who were faithful this week to reach out and I pray for this coming week you would give us opportunity once again Give us sensitivity to those people who are around us. We come and we open our hearts to you, Father. Thank you for your word, which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And like the psalmist, we tremble before it. We revere you because you have revealed yourself, not just in the person of Christ, but in your written word. And so as we open it, open our minds to the truth. Holy Spirit, be our helper today. Be our teacher. Help us to see how it applies to us. Father, help me, fill me and anoint me and use me, I pray, that I might lift up Jesus, and I ask it in his holy name. Amen. Take your Bibles this morning, please, and turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 16. Most people can at least find the book of Revelation and the book of Genesis, the first and the last book in the Bible. But not all Americans can pronounce the name of this book. It's not the book of Revelations. There's no S on it. It's the book of Revelation because it's a single revelation that God gave through his son to the Apostle John, and he wrote down for us his bondservants. It's a very relevant book to study at this time in human history. And if we're not living in the time frame that is described in this book, we're living, I tell you, right on the threshold of it, Because so many pieces of the puzzle that God reveals in this book are beginning to come together. I mean, think about it. For many who are sitting in this room, in your lifetime, you've witnessed the rebirth of the nation of Israel in their gathering back into the land. The first time since the time of Josephus, the first century historian, the first time that demographics were kept on the Jewish people was in 1890. And at that time... 3% of the 7.8 million Jews who were alive in 1890, 3% or about 25,000 were living in the land of Israel. Then during World War II, Hitler annihilated some 6 million of the Jews. 
But as God often does, he uses the wrath of man to praise him. And he used those events of the Second World War to gather the Jewish people back into the land. And in 1948, on May the 14th, Israel in a single day, as the prophet Isaiah wrote, was once again reestablished as a nation. At the time, there were just 600,000 Jewish people living in the land. Today, there are approximately 6.6 million Jewish people living. That's nearly half of all the Jewish people on the planet. You say, well, is the return of the Jewish people into the land of Israel significant? Yes, it is. It is something that God says will happen not just in the last days, but in latter times. The term latter times, latter days, refers to the very final chapter before the Messiah, Jesus, comes back to rule and reign upon the earth. Listen to what God said through the prophet Ezekiel. Therefore, say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you, the peoples, and assemble you out of the countries among which you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. In 70 AD, the Jewish people were begun to be scattered, and then in the second Jewish revolt in 135, the rest of the Jewish people were virtually all expelled out of Israel to all the nations of the world. And that land, in terms of Jewish people, was virtually vacant. But God said at the end of time, he would take them from all the countries. Listen to Ezekiel 36. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Listen to what the prophet Zechariah wrote after the Babylonian return in 480 B.C. in the 10th chapter of his prophecy. God said, I will whistle for them to gather them together, for I have redeemed them, and they will be as numerous as they were before. When I scatter them among the peoples, they will remember me in far countries, and they with their children will live and come back. Again, Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, describing the time before the second coming of the Messiah. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. North, former Soviet Union, south, east, west, from all across the world, God promises to bring the Jewish people back into the land. And if that were not enough, he even names in Isaiah 11 some of the specific countries that they will come from. Think about this for a moment. In 1948, as this chart shows, in Egypt there were approximately 66,000 Jews. Today in that country there are less than 200. That's one of the countries named in Isaiah's prophecy. Iraq, which in his prophecy is Assyria and Babylon. There was 150,000 Jews. Today, there's less than 10. In Syria, called Hamath, in 1948, there were 15,000 Jews. Today, there's less than 100. In Iran, what Isaiah calls Elam, there was 95,000 Jews. Today, there's 9,826. In Yemen, there was 48,000. Today, there's less than 50. In Lebanon, 20,000. Today, less than 100. Algeria, 144, 140,000. Today, less than 100. Morocco, 265,000. Today, less than 2,000. Tunisia, 105,000. Today, under 1,000. Libya, 38,000. Today, none. Ethiopia, 50,000. Today, under 8,000. Even Ethiopia was a miracle. All the Ethiopian Jews came through Solomon. They looked totally African-American, but they're totally Jewish. Through Operation Moses in 1984, 8,000 were brought out. Through Operation Joshua in 1985, 1,000 were brought out. And then in Operation Solomon, 14,325 were airlifted. It was an incredible maneuver that the Israeli people did undercover. There's about 8,000 left, and they all want to leave that place and come back to Israel. So think about it. God has been gathering his people. They won't all be gathered, but there'll be enough to call them a nation, to be strong, and for the final prophecies to be fulfilled. And then at the end of the tribulation, the final amount of believing Jews will also be brought back into the land. Think about some of you who are alive here today. You've seen the resurgence of 
Russia as a world power. They are one of the key nations that are spoken of in the prophets that are going to hate and attack Israel. We've seen the birth of Islam. We've seen the rise of a sodomite society. These are all things that God wrote and predicted and prophesied would happen in the final days before Jesus comes back. Now, if you were here last time, by the way, we've been working our way chapter by chapter and verse by verse through the Revelation. And last week, we finished Revelation 15. Today, we're in 16. And I'm going to give some theological backdrop before we begin to exegete the 16th chapter and what follows in the rest of the book. But notice here in chapter 16, in verse uh, 13, and I saw it coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Underscore those final words, the great day of God, the Almighty. It's one of the many titles given for the time frame in the Bible known as the day of the Lord. And so as we attempt to garner a clear picture of what the great day of God the Almighty, the day of the Lord is all about, I'm going to push the pause button today in our exegesis of the 16th chapter. And God willing, I'm going to lay a biblical foundation for the day of the Lord because it will, I think, make 16 through 22 of the Revelation come alive for you. Now, the Bible teaches that Christ is crucified, risen, and ascended to heaven, but that he is coming again to judge the living and the dead. But it is also very clear that before he comes again, it will be preceded by a time of darkness. Then he will literally, physically come to the earth, and there will be a time of great blessing that will last for over a thousand years. We'll study that in the 19th and 20th chapters. And then as we will see at the end of chapter 20, at the end of the thousand years, it will get dark again. And then God will create a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. But of course, before that event takes place, another event is going to happen that will usher in the day of the Lord, and we've been studying that. It's called the rapture. Now, if you're new to the Bible and maybe just a casual reader of Scripture, you cannot help but see that all through the pages, especially of the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well, there are predictions that God's Son is going to come back to earth again. In fact, We are not surprised by that but because when we come to the 19th chapter of the Revelation, it says the spirit of Jesus is the spirit of testimony. And so we are going to see that, or the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so we're going to see that prophecy is something that God has interwined all the way through the Scripture. He did it for the first coming of the Messiah, and he will do it for his son's return from heaven. In fact, the Bible ends with Jesus saying, yes. I am coming quickly. And then John will say, Amen. I believe it. Even so come, Lord Jesus. But before that happens, there's a whole lot that is going to happen. So we're going to use this morning 1 Thessalonians 5 as the central text. If you have your Bible, flip over to 1 Thessalonians 5. In the English Bible, all the books with the letter T are found together. They're all in the New Testament. They go from long to short. Thessalonians, two books, is longer than the word Timothy, first and second, which is longer than the word Titus. So turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's what we would call a central passage. Sometimes you will hear pastors and theologians say, well, this is a central passage on this subject. What they mean by that is that this is one of the building block passages that speak about a particular subject. So we would say, for instance, that... um, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 is a central passage on the subject of spiritual gifts. Well, this is one of many central passages in the Bible on the subject of the great day of the coming God, the Almighty, the coming day of the Lord, and then we'll break out into some other passages because it's found all the way through Scripture. I want to begin by reading 1 Thessalonians 5, starting now in verse 1. Follow along in your Bibles. Now, as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. 
For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing. Let me set the context for these verses. I suppose there are two distinct issues that people are often fascinated and sometimes perplexed by. One is what happens after you die. And then secondly, how will the end of the world come? What does the Bible say on these two subjects? Well, this letter, 1 Thessalonians, actually addresses both. In chapter 4 of this letter, he deals with the subject of death. And then in chapter 5, he deals, in essence, with the end of the world. Now, if you know chapter 4, then you know that the church at Thessalonica was somewhat ignorant concerning the order of events concerning Christ's return. They had come to believe that the rapture was only for those who were alive. And so one of their questions concerned when would those believers who have already died, when would they be raised up, and would they even have a chance to participate in the coming kingdom of the Messiah? They knew that they could be caught up at any time. They had that much strength. But they didn't really know about those who had already died and when they would be raised. And so let me begin by giving you kind of a biblical schematic and calendar of events. As you know, the next great event on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. The word rapture is found in 1 Thessalonians 4. We shall all be caught up. God is going to take his people off the earth up into heaven. There will be a short period of time before the 70th week of Daniel begins. Could be days, hours, weeks, we're not told precisely. But there will be a one world ruler who will come on the scene. We've been studying him. He's called the Antichrist. He's called the Beast. Over 30 titles are given for this one world leader in the Bible. And a seven year period called the Tribulation will kick off. That will culminate with Jesus physically, literally, actually coming back to the earth. And when he does, the Bible teaches he will rule and reign on the earth for. 1,000 years. At the end of the 1,000 years, Satan has been caged up the whole time. He'll be loosed, and there'll be one final rebellion, which Jesus will put down. This current planet and universe in which we sit in will be totally destroyed. God will make a brand new heaven, a brand new earth, and the new Jerusalem will literally come down and become the capital city of the place in which we are going to spend all of eternity. Now, Sometimes you will hear people say, well, the first thing on your chart, Pastor, the rapture, that's not even in the Bible. Where do you get the rapture from? And because they cannot find the word rapture in the Bible, they assume it's not a biblical doctrine. And so those people are what we call amillennialists. Let me give you a chart. They don't believe that Jesus comes back before he rules and reigns for a thousand years, but they say there's no millennium. They say right now God is building his church. In fact, they say the church existed in the Old Testament, that the church has always existed. Uh, It was more Jewish in the Old Testament, but now it's a mixed group of people. Uh, We're under tribulations and hardship, but there's no literal tribulation. Jesus is reigning spiritually from heaven, and the next event that is coming is called the second coming. And at that point, it will all be over. We'll go to heaven, and that's it. 
And all of the prophecies that speak specifically about God's relationship and promises to the nation of Israel, of God creating a, a new heaven and a new earth and a capital city coming down, a literal one world government and antichrist, they just write all that off. It's very simple, the chart, but it's simplistic and it's just wrong. But they begin with the premise that the term rapture is not a biblical doctrine, and it is also driven by the fact that they think that God's done with the Jewish people. But God is not done with the Jewish people. Replacement theology, that the church has replaced Israel, is false theology. It is wrong. Now, some of our brethren hold it, and they're brothers in Christ. They're not heretics, and that it's a damnable belief that will carry you to hell. But it is still an erroneous belief. It is a belief that is not sinking with Scripture. It is true that the word rapture is not found in the English Bible, but it is found in the Latin Bible. And the Latin edition of the Bible was the principal translation the Western church used from 400 and, uh, years before Christ to about 1530 years, excuse me, 400 A.D. to 1530 A.D. For over a thousand years, the translation that the Western church used was Latin. That's all they had. We have a multiplicity of translations today. For instance, there's about 20 major English translations, but there's over 250 English translations that are available to us. In some countries of the world, they're glad just to have a single translation of the Bible. But there was a time when God's people just had principally the Latin Bible, and a lot of terms come out of Latin, like the word Trinity. Now, that's not a word you'll find in the Bible, but if you deny the doctrine of the Trinity, you are are a heretic because the Bible teaches that God is one who exists in three co-eternal, co-equal persons. The five solas of the Reformation, they come right out of Latin, so many r Latin terms. Now, if you don't like the word rapture, then just use the word that's used in the English Bible, caught up. We believe in the catching up of the church, the harpazo, that in a moment time, God is going to take his people away. But what I want you to see, and this is what the church at Thessalonica hadn't put totally together, and you'll see why in a moment, that the second coming and the rapture are two distinct events. Here's a chart that will help us. I scribble these things out. I give them to Steve, and he makes it look all beautiful. Now, at the rapture of the church, Christ comes in the air, whereas at the second coming, he comes to the earth. In 1 Thessalonians 4, across the page, it says, we will meet the Lord in the air. Whereas at the second coming, he comes to the earth. Listen to what the prophet Zechariah said. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. Now, is that just a lot of gibberish, or is it true? Has it ever happened? No, it hasn't. Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives into the second coming. He's going to plant his feet on the Mount of Olives. He's going to split it in two. There's going to be living water, the Bible says, that will flow all the way to the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea in which nothing lives, people will fish at. God's not just blowing a lot of words out of his mouth. Those are literal actual prophecies that are going to take place. So in the rapture, we meet the Lord in the air. The second coming, he comes to the earth. This chart also shows a second difference in terms of who comes to gather each group of persons. Christ comes for his people at the rapture, whereas at the second coming, angels come to take away the lost. The rapture, it says, the Lord himself, verse 16 across the page of chapter 4, the Lord himself will descend from heaven. He's coming for us. But at the second coming, God is going to send his angels to get the lost. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 13. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. So this chart indicates there's one major difference. There's a third difference, and it concerns where each group of persons are taken. When God comes at the rapture for his people, we're carried up 
into heaven. But the lost are removed from the earth into a place the Bible calls Hades. The fact that he will meet us in the air, there's an implication that we're going to heaven, but he specifically stated so in the upper room discourse. In John 14, he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. However, the second coming, he is not coming to take believers to heaven. He is coming to take unbelievers and to remove them off the earth to set them in that place called Hades. Again, in Matthew 13, the Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In fact, Jesus stated the same truth in the same sermon in Matthew 24, 37. He said, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Has nothing to do with the rapture. Hal Lindsey made that up. He was just off. He went to the same seminary I had and went, I went to, and when, he, when I was there, so many of the professors were so upset that he ever came up with that invented truth. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. Just like in Noah's day, the people who were carried away by the great flood and judgment was an unbelieving world. And the believers, knowing his family were left, at the return of Jesus, all unbelievers will be removed from the earth, and the believers will be left. In the parallel passage in Luke 17, Jesus said, two men will be in the field. One will be taken, and the other will be left. In answering, they said to him, where, Lord? And he said to them, where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. Now, we live in an area in South Carolina where we have turkey buzzards. We have vultures. They're very visible. And when we see them, we know that there is something dead that is going on. Jesus' point is, much as a dead body causes the vultures to gather, so spiritually dead people are consigned to judgment because they are not fit to the kingdom. We're going to study that when we come to Revelation 19, so I'll save it for them. But even so, when Christ returns, the righteous will be left behind. Those tribulation saints who come to faith and survive physically the tribulation, they will be left on the earth, and they'll enter the millennial reign of the Messiah. Just like Noah and his family were left in a brand new refurbished world, even so, God's people who are alive at the second coming, they will enter into a refurbished world world where there'll be even a certain amount of harmony in the creation. So the rapture, believers are taken away, and unbelievers are left on the earth. But at the second coming, unbelievers are taken away, and believers are left on the earth. People do not want to be left behind for the rapture, but people who are alive during the tribulation period, they want to be left behind because that means they are believers. Now, this chart also gives us another distinct difference between these two events. At the rapture of the church, Jesus comes before the hour of trial, before the great tribulation, whereas at the second coming, he comes after the hour of trial. We studied already in Revelation 3.10, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Has there ever been an hour of testing that has come upon the whole world? Never, ever, ever, ever. But it's going to happen because Jesus said, and he is going to take out those believers. Listen to Matthew chapter 25 and what Jesus says happens at the end of the tribulation. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, 
Then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Now, this chart also gives us another distinction between these two events, the rapture and the second coming. At the rapture, there are no signs for the rapture. His return is what we call imminent. It could happen at any moment. Whereas the second coming, there are many signs that must be fulfilled for Jesus to come back. The Lord Jesus could have returned in John's lifetime. And the apostles, indeed, were looking for them. Remember, even before the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D., some thought maybe the Antichrist would go into that temple and during the tribulation period. Of course, that was decimated, totally torn down, but Jesus said that was going to happen. And so only those who weren't spiritually perceptive would have concluded that. But they believe that God could have come for his people and then any remaining prophecies would be fulfilled thereafter. There are no signs Ever that have been needed to be fulfilled for Jesus to catch up his church. He could have come back a week after he ascended into heaven if he so chose. But of course, he didn't so choose because he had a commission to go on the world and to preach the gospel that men and women and boys and girls could come and believe. So the return of Jesus for his church is imminent. But the second coming is a prophecy-driven event. But what is so amazing is that we have been so privileged to see some of the prophecies for the second coming be fulfilled in our very lifetime which tells you the rapture is that much closer. I've told you many times, in October when you go into Walmart and it's the time of Halloween, the Christmas decorations go up. What does that tell you? It tells you Thanksgiving is near. Why? Because Thanksgiving precedes Christmas. When you begin to see God fulfill prophecy for the second coming, a Sodomite world, which God prophesied for the coming of the Son of Man will be like the days of Lot. Israel regathered into the nation. Russia, one world power. And on and on we could go. When you see prophecy like that being fulfilled in your lifetime, then you know that the catching of the church is that much closer. All right? So there's also, and by the way, there are 19 specific prophecies that are given for the second coming in Matthew chapter 24. We've hit on a number of them already in our study of the Revelation. Also, there's a distinction in these two events in terms of the timing of the resurrection that will take place. The resurrection of the rapture takes place when Christ comes and we meet him in the air. Whereas the resurrection at the second coming takes place after he descends to the earth. Look back at chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians 4. And notice the end of verse 16. It says, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. That happens before the tribulation. God is going to catch up his people. Now, we'll study that again in just a second, so I'll put the pause button on it. But listen to these words in Daniel 12. Listen to what happens at the end of the tribulation. Now, at that time, Michael, you know him, the archangel, Michael, the great prince, who stands guard over the sons of your people, speaking of Israel, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. Sound familiar? Sounds a lot like Jesus' words. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake these to everlasting life. So after the tribulation, Old Testament saints will be resurrected. They right now have a temporary body. Just like if you died today, you won't get your resurrection body. You'll have a temporary body like Moses and Elijah did. They're in the Mount of Transfiguration like Samuel when he was brought up. It's a temporary body. But you are awaiting the resurrection body. Well, the resurrection of Old Testament saints happens at the end of the seven-year period. In the rapture, God comes for his people, the church. He takes us up. At the second coming, he takes the Old Testament saints out of the grave, and he gives them a resurrection body. There's also another kind of difference between the rapture and the second coming, and it concerns the kind of bodies that those who are alive 
alive at each event will receive. Follow this. Now, the rapture of the church, those believers who are alive will receive a glorified body. Whereas at the second coming, those believers who are alive, they will continue in their natural body. Now, listen to this. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul wrote, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. When we get to heaven, we'll have resurrection bodies. And Jesus said, in one sense, we will be like the angels. Now, don't say we will be angels. I've had more people say, well, he's an angel now in heaven, and he's got his angel wings. No, you don't become an angel when you die. Angels are angels. People are people. You don't become an angel. But we're like the angels, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given a marriage, but are like angels in heaven. When we get our resurrected bodies, we'll be like angels and that we will no longer propagate a race. Angels don't have little angel babies, cherubs. God made a fixed number of angels never to create any more. However, those who are alive at the second coming will enter the thousand-year reign of Christ in their natural bodies. And the world is going to be rejuvenated. The lion will lay down with the wolf. The baby will play next to the cobra's nest and not be harmed. People will have children because they will be in their natural bodies and they'll live a long extended period of time, much like they did before the time of the great flood. And so what I want you to see in these seven distinctions on this chart is that the rapture and the second coming, they are so different you cannot make them a single event. Now, of course, the church at Thessalonica, go back to our chart here, the church at Thessalonica, there we go, couldn't create this kind of schematic. Why not? All they had, for the most part, was the Old Testament. The New Testament was being written, and nobody, virtually anybody, had a private copy of Scripture. Only the wealthy Christians did. You went to a particular locale, and the public reading of Scripture was not to be neglected because that's where you would hear the Word of God. Since the invention of the printing press, since the completion of the Bible, we can open the Scripture and study it from one end to the other. So they couldn't create the schematic because much of the New Testament had not yet been written. But we can go back, we can read it, we can study it. And so they're trying to understand, what if someone dies before the rapture of that church? When are they going to be resurrected? And will they miss the millennial reign of the Messiah? And so look what he says in chapter 4 and verse 13. We do not want you to be uninformed. We don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, about those who are asleep. Now, some of your translations say those who are dead, but asleep is better. He's describing someone who's dead, someone who is asleep in death, but dead is a paraphrase, and it's important to retain the original like most good English translations do, those who are asleep, because he's underscoring there's as much hope for the body as there is for the soul, that the state of the body is temporary, that God is going to raise it up. So we don't want you, my brethren, to be ignorant about those who are dead asleep, so that you may not grieve as do the rest in unbelieving world who have zero hope. Because, he says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and that's the confession we've just seen in both services that is done at baptism, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. The moment you die, absent from the body, present with the Lord. You're in the presence of the Lord Jesus, and so for me to live as Christ, to die is not a loss. It is a great gain. But we are still, those saints in heaven, awaiting the resurrection of their glorified bodies. So he says in verse 15, their body that's in the ground, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not perceive those who have fallen asleep. 
Answer to your question, no, they will not miss the millennial reign of the Messiah. In fact, when Jesus comes back, the first to come out of the grave are those who are six feet under. And they need a head start. They're six feet under the ground. We're being taken off the earth. And so they come out of the grave first, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So he will bring back with him departed souls and spirits from heaven. He'll reconnect it with the body in the grave. The, those in the grave come out first, and those of us who are living and alive will be caught up, and there'll be a great reunion in the sky. We'll be caught up with them, verse 17, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Wherever Jesus goes, as we goes. When he comes back at the second coming, we're going to be right there with him. When he is reigning for a thousand years, we're going to be right there with him. When he creates a new heaven and a new earth, we will be right there with him. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And so, in the twinkling of an eye, that's faster than you can blink an eye, Jesus is going to take the living off the earth, the dead out of the grave. That concerns the status of their dead loved ones. Now when he comes into chapter 5, he deals with a new aspect with the great day of the Lord, the great day of God the Almighty, as it's called in Revelation 16. And there are two simple principles that are foundational to your understanding the rest of the Revelation that I want you to get this morning. First concerns there on your outline, the meaning of the day of the Lord. Let's think for just a few minutes about the meaning of the day of the Lord. Look how chapter 5 opens. Now, as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. The word time is the Greek word chronos. We get our word chronology. It refers to a period of time. As to the times and the epics, that's the word kairos, it refers to a point in time. And so as to the general time and the specific time concerning the day of the Lord... You have no need of nothing to be written to you. Why not? Because I've already taught you a whole lot about that. By the way, they weren't alone, though, in asking some of these questions. There are people throughout time who've asked these questions concerning the return of Jesus from heaven. Do you remember the apostles there on the, not all of them, but a handful of them, they're on the Mount of Olives and they just left the temple and they're, they're sitting on the Mount of Olives. You can see the Temple Mount. I'm on the top of the Mount of Olives and where that camera is across, the, that, that, that's the Temple Mount. And uh, they're, they're looking at the glorious, magnificent temple, the Herodian temple, the second temple that was built with Zerubbabel and then remanufactured and built up. And they said, Lord, look at that place. And Jesus said, there's not going to be one stone left upon another. And then they said, well, when is this going to happen? So he, he gives them an immediate fulfillment of prophecy because, you see, a prophet to be counted as a true prophet. And Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. He's more than a prophet. He's God in human flesh. But he fulfills three Old Testament offices. He's prophet, priest, and king. And to be a true prophet, he's called by Moses the Messiah, the prophet. They ask, are you the prophet to come? Remember, they asked him that in John's gospel. Are you the prophet that Moses spoke of? Are you the Messiah? Well, to be a true prophet, you had to give a short-range prophecy and a long-range prophecy, and he gave many. Some immediate that were fulfilled right in his lifetime and some that were fulfilled shortly after his lifetime. He said, look, not one stone is going to remain upon another. And then he begins to unfold the events that will bring about his second coming from heaven. And they say in verse 3 of that chapter, tell us when these things will be. And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And he proceeded to tell them what would happen. And in the midst of that great discourse, Jesus made this statement. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. Now Jesus knows now, but he's in his human body. He has laid aside the exercise of some of his divine attributes. We've discussed this already in the Revelation. He knows precisely the time now as the omniscient God in his glorified body. But one important thing you want to leave with this verse is you ought to be skeptical of anyone who's a date setter. 
Now, I was privileged to study under one of the greatest eschatologists, some think in the last 200 years, J. Dwight Pentecost. And Dr. Pentecost would often tell us, those who leave little room for mystery leave much room for mistake. In other words, people who have it so nailed down because it sells books like setting a date, and there are foolish Americans who buy books, who do all kinds of crazy things because someone said, well, Jesus is coming on September the 14th, or he's coming on this date or that date. They are contradicting the plain teaching of Scripture. And the devil loves that because it brings great shame and discredit to pastors like myself and to Christians like you that believe the Bible. Remember just before Jesus left for heaven, he's on the Mount of Olives, and they ask him again about his return. And he said, it is not for you to know the times or epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority. The times and epics for the second coming, you don't know. Now, the times and epics for the day of the Lord is a separate event, you do know. So go back here to chapter 5, verse 1. As to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. Why? Because Paul had given some previous instruction. So let's think about the times and the epics of the day of the Lord. Uh, let's for a moment first consider the length of the day. What do we mean by the day of the Lord? Let's think for a moment just about the length of the day. When you see the word day in the Bible, it's used in principally one of three ways. Sometimes it's used of daylight. Right now I can see the daylight through that back door. It's daylight right now. It's daytime. It's day. So sometimes it just refers to the light of the day, that time between dawn and sunset. Sometimes it's used in the Bible to refer to a literal 24-hour time frame. And so in the days of creation, one day, two day, three day, and so forth, he's talking about literal 24-hour days in which the world was created. Now, some Christian people, they are almost embarrassed by that, and they want to impregnate science into the text of Genesis 1. And they say, well, the days aren't literal 24-hour days, but they're long days of millions of years. Or they are 24-hour days, but there's huge gaps of time between each and every day. But every time in the Hebrew Bible where a number is attached to the word yom or day, 410 times, it refers to a literal 24-hour day. And even the most liberal of scholars don't debate that. But some reason when you come to Genesis 1, we don't want to make it 24-hour days. We want to make it long geologic ages of millions of years. But my friend, that undermines the gospel. Because now you have death and disease and thorns and suffering before the fall, where the Bible says it was as a result of the fall. Hey, look, have you ever asked yourself why God made the world in six days? Why didn't he make the world in six hours or six minutes or no time at all? Well, I don't have to wonder. Moses gave me the answer in Exodus 20. Listen to this. Remember the Sabbath day, the fourth commandment, to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. For in six days, and now Moses gives us divine commentary by the Holy Spirit who is writing through his pen, men of old moved by the Spirit of God, he gives us divine commentary on how he understood the days of creation. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and make it holy, made it holy. Now think about it, the concept of a year being approximately 365 days doesn't necessarily come from the Bible. You can get that from science, from information outside of the Bible, because it takes approximately 365 days for the earth to make a full loop all the way around the sun. The concept of a 24-hour day can come from outside of the Bible because it takes approximately 24 hours for the earth to make a full spin on its axis. But the concept of a week comes only from the Bible. 
God didn't make the world in six days or six seconds or six hours. He made it in six literal, actual days he made the world. I, I, not six months, or you know what I mean. Uh, he made it in six days. Why? To send a message that we need one and seven to rest. So sometimes the word day refers to daylight. Sometimes it refers to a literal 24-hour day. But sometimes it refers to an extended period of time. Even in Genesis 2, listen to what Moses wrote. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. Here Moses is summing up the six days of creation with the phrase, in the day. We use it that sometimes that way in English. We speak of the day of our youth. We don't mean that we were a youth for a day, but for that extended period of time that we were a youth, we use the phrase the day of our youth. Even so, the phrase the day of the Lord in the Bible does not refer to a 24-hour day, but an extended period of time. But what is so interesting is that the day of the Lord mimics a biblical day. Some of you went with me to Israel last time and in the, we, we had a Sabbath meal, and the Sabbath meal begins when the Sabbath starts. So with my family, we went to the, the, the hotel, the wall there, and, and the Jewish people were celebrating. Of course, it was the uh, magnificent celebration of there being a nation and the Jerusalem becoming officially their, their, their capital, at least in uh, our president's mind and the world's mind, some who oppose it, and a time of great, great celebration. And the Orthodox people kept looking up in the sky at one point. They were looking for three stars. And when they saw those three bright stars in the sky, just everything went dead. Music stopped, dancing stopped. The Sabbath had begun. And it would go all the way for 24 hours until the next evening. So you see, a biblical day goes from sundown to sundown. And you know that even as a Christian. People say, well, how do you get a Friday death and a Sunday resurrection and count three days? Well, he died on Sunday before sunset. That's day one. They wanted to get his body buried before the Sabbath began. Day two was sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. And then on the third day, early Sunday morning, he was raised from the dead. Well, even so, as this slide shows us, you can think of the day of the Lord in the same way. The rapture of the church will take place, and at some point when the 70th week of the prophecy that Daniel wrote about, that is seven years long, that Paul articulates, that the Revelation explains, a seven-year period begins, and it's a dark time, and it gets progressively dark. We haven't seen anything yet. We've studied the seal judgments, we've studied the trumpet judgments, but the bowl judgments will just make you shiver. It will get so dark. But then Jesus will come back, and it's going to get so bright. It's going to be a magnificent day. He'll rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, the devil's been locked up, but we're going to see he's going to be loosed. And those who enter the tribulation in their natural bodies who will have children and children and children and children, some of their children won't believe. You say, how could they not believe with Jesus literally reigning on the earth? How could they not believe when he literally walked on the earth? It will show you how fallen we really are. It will be a magnificent demonstration of how gracious and kind God is in delivering us from our sin. And then it will get dark again for a short time. And then it will be a bright and glorious eternal day. And so the S-O-N is compared in the Bible to the S-U-N. And so it will be the day of the Lord. Now, we're looking at, in the Revelation initially, the dark side of the day. But when we come to chapter 20, we're going to look at the bright side of the day. Now, we're going to see at the end of 20 how it will get dark again. And then we'll see how it will be forever bright, never to get dark again, and the eternal state that God has prepared for us. So, that's the length of the day. In addition, I want us to think for just a moment 
about the lament of the day. The lament of the day. Lest anyone think that this day that is going to come is going to be rosy and cozy, they need to think again. It gets progressively darker. And when the church is raptured and those unbelievers are left behind, they're going to end up lamenting. They're going to cry. They're going to weep. And Paul said, to some degree, you should have known this. How would they have known it? He taught them. Where did he teach them from? Well, virtually the only scriptures they had at the time, the Old Testament. Maybe he read this to them from Joel 2. Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord, that's what we're talking about, is coming. Surely it is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people. There was, has never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it to the years of many generations. A fire consumes before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but a desolate wilderness behind them, and nothing at all escapes them. God tells us there is never, ever, ever been a day like this. It's a severe day. Maybe he read Jeremiah chapter 30 that describes this day. Alas, for the day is great, there is none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's distress, but he'll be saved from it. Again, he's describing the first initial darkness of these seven years. Maybe he read Daniel 12 to them. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation. Until that time. And at that time, your people, the Jewish people, everyone who's found written in the book will be rescued. Listen to what Jesus said. He described it in the same terms. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. And unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days would be cut short. God said that unless he somehow intervened, no one on the planet could have survived this seven-year period. Now listen, to skirt around this is to spiritualize the Word of God. Jesus literally fulfilled all 333 prophecies for His first coming. And He is going to fulfill the prophecy for His second coming in the exact same way. And people may laugh and jeer at pastors like me that describe this coming day, but I'm telling you it is going to happen. Listen to Revelation chapter 6. Remember in the six seals, the first of all the cosmic disturbances in the universe happened, and the sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks and the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide from us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Oh, we think often of the gentleness of the good Savior. But there's also the wrath of the Lamb that is coming. It is inescapable. In Revelation 9, 6, And in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death flees from them. Even a person who wants to commit suicide, as we've already studied, will be unable to commit suicide during this day. It is inescapable. Again, people may mock Jesus. They may use his name in vain and ridicule what he has said, but they are going to meet the wrath of the Lamb lest they repent. Now, beyond the length of the day and the lament of the day, let's think for a moment about the language of that day. The language of the day. Again, here in verse 1, uh, Paul does not need to write to them about the times and the epics because he's already spelled it out for them. Again, he says, notice verses 2 and 3, For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they're saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. Now, just before this cataclysmic day begins to unfold, the people who are left behind, because of the rider on the white horse, they'll be saying peace and safety. 
Everything's okay. Ah. Oh. Everything's wonderful. We finally have the utopia, the one world union we've always wanted. And then suddenly, the second horseman of the apocalypse comes. And suddenly, like labor pains upon a woman would shout, they will not escape. I believe the nations of the world in many ways are unknowingly preparing for this coming time. They're trying to build a new world order. They'll be saying peace and safety, but then the wrath of the Lamb will come. And he uses two vivid similes to describe the day of the Lord. One is like a thief in the night, and then the other is like a pregnant woman. Now think about this. The day of the Lord is just like a thief in the night. When someone breaks into your home at night, and that's when they often do it under the cover of darkness, they don't send you a note and say, be ready, get your shotgun out, because I'm coming at 3 a.m. No, they just show up. Well, the day of the Lord is going to come unexpectedly, suddenly. It's the first word in the Greek, sentence to underscore its suddenness. He's all of a sudden going to break into the day of the Lord. He is going to come like a thief in the night. But he is speaking not of us, but of them. Remember the pronoun in chapter 4 and verse 15. We shall all be caught up. But now here he speaks of them. He is speaking of the unbelievers who are left behind. Now notice the second similar he uses. First the day of the Lord will come like a thief, but then he says it will come like destruction upon a woman in labor. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape. Now it will come like labor. Now think your way through this. Suddenly, all of a sudden, a woman, her water breaks and labor begins. So it happens suddenly. But on the other hand, it is very much expected, is it not? I mean, as soon as a woman finds out she's pregnant, she knows what she's going to meet in nine months. She knows labor is a coming. It's nine months away. And there's nothing that can be done. But just like a burglar suddenly breaks into your house at night, and just like labor suddenly begins, there are still some distinct differences between these two similes. The suddenness of a thief in the night is totally unexpected. But the suddenness of a woman going into labor is totally unavoidable. Once it starts... There's no turning back. In the first case, there's no warning. In the second case, there's no escape. Even men who want to commit suicide will be unable to do so. Now, that's the meaning of the day of the Lord as it relates to its length, its lament, and its language. Then quickly, let's just talk about the message of the day of the Lord. What is the message? He gets very practical and applicable beginning in verse 4. First, we're to wake up. We're to wake up. Follow along. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We're not of night nor of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Now, a real shift here. Verse 3, while they, but verse 4, but you. Now he's speaking to believers. He's speaking to us. And Paul is saying there's no need for true believers to be alarmed over the prospect of this day. Why? Because we won't be here. But with that said, the fact that we're not to be here is not to be an excuse as to how we should live. Listen, it's very interesting here what he says when he uses the word asleep. We're not to be asleep. Now, the word asleep that's used in chapter 4 is of someone who is dead physically. It's a different Greek word. The word that is used here is someone who is dead spiritually, someone who is spiritually out of it, someone who is spiritually lethargic. And we're not to be lethargic. We're not to be like a drunk man. We are to be alert. We are to be sober. We are to be ready. Let me ask you a question while we're here. If Jesus were to come and rapture the church right now, would he come during, when, when do you think he'll come? Do you think he'll come at night or during the day? What do you think? You don't have to answer out loud. Well, if he came in the next 10 seconds, it is daytime. But on the other side of the planet, it'd be nighttime, right? All right, so that's in terms of the rapture. But spiritually speaking, 
when Jesus comes back. Will he come in the day for you or in the night? Depends where you are. Depends whether or not you've been born again and your eyes have been opened and you are living like a born again person or if you're spiritually dead and like a drunken man. Look, follow what he says. We need to listen to this. So then, he says, we're not to sleep as others do, but we're to be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober. When do most people normally sleep? Well, you say they sleep at night. It's natural to sleep at night. And so indifference to the things of God is natural for the lost person. His heart is not on fire for the things of God. He is spiritually asleep. When do most people get drunk? Well, most people get drunk at night. That's when most people have their parties. And just as it's natural for the lost people of this world to get drunk at night, even so it is natural for lost people to be in a drunken stupor in terms of what is really happening theologically. A lost person today is as unstable theologically as a drunk man is on his feet. I think everything's fine. Everything's okay, and especially after the church is raptured and the man on the white horse who mimics Jesus comes. Oh, finally at last we have the utopia that we've wanted. And then the wrath of God begins to unfold like a thief, like a woman in labor. So number one, we're called to wake up. We're not to be like the world. We're not to be in our spiritual pajamas. We need to know what is happening so that we can make a different set of choices. We are to wake up. Secondly, we're to dress up. Look at verse 8. We're to dress up. Since then we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation. Listen, there are two things you need to protect in these last days. One is your heart. The other is your head. And several times in Paul's letter, he likens a Christian to a soldier in the armor that we are to wear. And so first he tells us to put on the breastplate of faith. A breastplate would protect the soldier's heart. And you need an unshakable faith. You're not to be moved around by all of the changes that are happening in our world. You're not to be flustered and confused and say, what is happening? happening. You need to have your mind in the Word of God so you can understand. Put on the, 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 the breastplate around your heart, but also, he says, put on the breastplate of love. There is to be love, certainly for lost people. I'm so thankful for some of you who've told me, I invited three people this week, Pastor, to Friend Day. That tells me you care about lost people. If you really know what's happening, you're not going to be so eaten up with your Facebook and social media where you don't even think about lost people. Priorities that God makes priorities will be yours. You'll have a love for the lost. You'll have a love for God. Listen, if you love God, you'll obey Him. And if you love God, you'll love that which He loves. And He loves His church. He loves His people. Don't tell me you're in love with the Lord and you're apathetic towards the local church. That's not what we are to be. But remember what is going to happen. Lawlessness, Jesus said, is increased. And most people's love will grow cold. The world is not going to get better spiritually. It's going to get more and more lawless like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. So you are to wake up. You are to dress up. Verse 8 says, but since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as the helmet, the hope of salvation. I hope you know by now that the word hope doesn't mean hope so, think so. I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow on my day off. It doesn't mean that. It speaks of something that is sure and certain and absolute. So when Paul here speaks of the hope of salvation, he's not wondering whether or not these people are going to make it to heaven. He's already described them as beloved by God. He's already described them as those who will meet the Lord in the air. No, he knows there are believers, and you can know that you're a believer on your way to heaven. These things I've written to you, John will write, who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you can know that you have eternal life. If you don't know that you know that you know that heaven is your home today, you should fix it before the day is over. The hope of salvation is not some wishful optimism. It is something that is sure and certain. And it's the future dimension to our salvation. Because there are three tenses 
is the salvation in the New Testament. We've been saved in the past from the peril and the penalty of sin. We call that justification, when God declares us righteous through faith in Christ. Right now, we're being saved by the power and the pollution of sin. We call that sanctification, as God is shaping us and molding us into the image of His Son. But some glorious day, from the very presence and pull of sin, when we get a new body like Christ, we call that glorification. That's the hope of our salvation. That is what we are looking for. Listen, we may not always know what is happening, but we know who is in control, and that's what Paul wants them to see, that God is not up in heaven wringing his hands, wondering what is going to happen. Listen, put on the breastplate of faith and love and the hope, the guarantee of your salvation. Finally, we are not only to wake up and to dress up, we are to look up. God wants us to look up. Look now, finally, at verses 9 and 10. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Now, the wrath that Paul is speaking of here is not the eternal wrath of God. Oh, that is coming. But he's speaking here of the wrath of the great tribulation period. It's been described that all the way all the way through the Revelation. Revelation 6.16, he spoke of the wrath of the Lamb. In Revelation 14, 19, we studied the great winepress of the wrath of God. In Revelation 15, last week, we studied in them the wrath of God is finished. Next time, Revelation 16, 1, go and pour out the seven bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. And so Paul is reminding them in this context, if you've been saved, you're not destined for that tribulation wrath. We already read this morning, Revelation 3:10. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you out of the hour of testing. You say, that's a fantastic promise for that church. No, it's not just for the church at Philadelphia, but for Laodicea and Ephesus and the people at Community Bible Church. Because he says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says, not to the church, but to the churches. When Jesus comes to rapture his church, he is going to take us out of this world before the Father brings those seven years of judgment that for some will turn into the eternal lake of fire. Listen, before God pours out his wrath, he'll take his children out. Before a nation goes against another kingdom, it takes its citizens out. Before God sent the great flood, he took Noah out. Before God brought judgment, he took Enoch out, a picture of the rapture. Before God sent fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah, he took Lot out. God is going to take us out. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing. Listen, if the church is going through the great tribulation, we shouldn't be looking up. We should be looking around. We shouldn't be looking for Christ from heaven. We should be looking for any Christ from hell. Listen, if we are going to face the great and terrible day of God the Almighty, we can't say with the Apostle John, even so come, Lord Jesus. All we can say is, even so come tribulation so Jesus can come. Listen, there's no comfort in those words that Paul is speaking of if God has his church going through the tribulation. Now listen, let me ask you, are you saved this morning? Do you know that you know that you know? If you do, some of us need to get our heads out of the sand and get busy. Look, there's a difference between being ready to go to heaven and being ready to meet the Lord. There's a big difference. If you've met Christ as your Savior, you're ready to go to heaven. If you've put your confidence in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus to save you, you're ready to go to heaven. But are you ready to meet the Lord? You see, the Bible teaches that when Jesus comes back in reference to some of his people, and now little children, John will write, abide in him. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. He's talking about saved people. Some saved people, when they see Jesus, they're going to shrink in shame. It's how I wasted my life. 
how I failed to invest my life in the things that really mattered to God. And they'll shrink in shame. But there'll be another group of people because they were unwilling to confess Jesus before men, proving they had never been born again. God will be ashamed of them, and He will never confess them before the Father. Is that you? Do you know you're going to have and you say, Pastor, I want to know, what do I need to do? You have to see that your sin, like my sin, is an offense to a holy God. You have to call it what it is. I spoke to a man recently. He said, I want to become a Christian, but I do not want to stop living with my girlfriend. I said, you don't need to become a Christian. You don't need a Savior until you're willing to call what God calls sin, sin. The Bible calls that repentance. Unless you repent, you perish. Unless you change your mind, what God says in this book and what He wrote in your human heart is evil. You have no need for a Savior. But if you come to Jesus with your sin, knowing that it's offensive to Him, for Him to forgive it and to begin the process of changing it, then you are ready to be saved. You need to come in simple, childlike faith. You need to call upon Jesus, for whoever will call upon His name, they will instantly and forever be saved. The Spirit of God will come to live inside of you. You'll have a birth from above. Your life will begin to change because you're a new creature in Christ. And when you die or when Jesus comes back, He'll take you straight up into heaven. Is that you today? is the day of salvation. Don't harden your heart. Father, thank you today for these words that you've given us. That this is not simply what you have said, but what you are saying. May we, your people, who have known you through faith in Christ, may we have ears to hear. May we think that this is not just a sermon for someone else. Well, this is a sermon for us to do some personal evaluation as to whether or not we're really investing in things that matter. Help us to warn people to flee the wrath that is coming. Thank you for those who are faithful to give us the good news. May we be good stewards of the treasure of the gospel. I pray today, Father, for someone who is here, who has never received Jesus, Thank you that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Thank you that your word says he received sinful men as he received me. And I pray today that someone would come and say, Lord Jesus, I ask you to save me. I put my confidence in the blood that you shed there on Golgotha as a complete and total payment for my sin that you demonstrated when you were raised from the dead. Lord Jesus, save me. Father, help someone today by your Spirit to call upon him in faith. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. And I want to ask somebody, you, maybe today, maybe a moment ago, you in simple faith said, Jesus, save me. I'm going to ask that you leave your seat and come to this front row. Maybe you did it last week or last month. You leave your seat and you come. And you're sitting on this front row today will be saying, I'm not ashamed of Jesus. Maybe you're here and you've never been baptized as we just saw this sister in Christ do. That was an emblem of her faith. The Bible teaches believe and then be baptized. It doesn't reverse it where it baptizes infants and later asks you to believe. Believe and then be baptized. That's always God's order. If you haven't had believer's baptism, I want to ask you to leave and to come. Maybe you're here and you're a Christian and you want to invest in the kingdom of God because God's put it in your heart to be a part of this fellowship. We would welcome that. We'd love to serve with you. So Matt's going to lead us. We're going to sing all three verses of this great hymn written by a great pastor of the 19th century, William R. Newell. Wrote one of the best commentaries ever on the book of Romans. Great theology in this hymn. You sing it, but for those who need to make a decision, come now.